<laughs> so welcome to everybody who has taken the time to come in person and welcome also to our Zoom audience. This event is hybrid and it is being recorded. This is the eighth event for New Mexico Listens Santa Fe County. New Mexico Listens is a joint project between the New Mexico Humanities Council operating on funding donated by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I'm especially happy this evening because our project director, Bethany Tabor, is here hosting this meeting. It means a lot to us in Santa Fe. It is also a cooperation with the League of Women Voters, Santa Fe County. And I'm also very happy that simultaneously with Bethany, we have Debbie Helper, who is the admin vice president of the Santa Fe County League and who is kind of the overall shepherd of what goes on in the Santa Fe County League. So thank you, Debbie, very much for coming and helping us tonight. This is our eighth event. We have two more in the works and it's called A Purpose Driven Community. We're based this evening at St. John's United Methodist Church because downstairs from here is the great big open room where we do what is the second largest food distribution in Northern New Mexico. And the reason for the session though, we're not going to do a harangue on hunger in New Mexico that we easily could do so. We are here to talk about a group of citizens, residents in Santa Fe who've come together to do something that's quite remarkable. And I'm going to turn things over now to Mary Ellen Kendrick, who is a co-coordinator of New Mexico Listens. Also in our audience is Dolph Bunkley, who is the other co-coordinator of the food distribution at St. John's. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Mary Ellen, who will talk about the St. John's food distribution. Well, welcome everyone. As Irene said, I am Mary Ellen Kendrick. I am the co-coordinator of the Bag and Hand Pantry, along with Dolph Bunkley, who is seated in the audience. I am also the Connections Coordinator here at St. John's. Before we start with the panel, I would like to give you a brief history and overview of the pantry. The pantry is an outreach ministry of St. John's United Methodist Church. As such, the church provides the facility rent-free space, all utilities, and support staff. The pantry is also a partner agency of the Food Depot. The Food Depot is our regional food bank located here in Santa Fe, and it is a partner of the national network Feeding America. The Food Depot supplies the pantry with USDA commodities, which are free, foods offered at a discount, donations they have received, and grocery store produce, meat, bread, pastries, and other items that are near their expiration date. In return, the pantry must follow the requirements of the Emergency Food Assistance Program, or TFAP. These ensure equal treatment for all of our customers and food safety. In the beginning, in the year 2000-2001, the pantry operated out of a closet. A large closet, but a closet nonetheless. This was after the associate pastor of St. John's had been keeping bags of food in his office. As the need grew, the partnership was formed with the Food Depot. In 2014, the church preschool closed and the current space was renovated by volunteers using donations by local companies. Pre-pandemic, the distribution was inside using the client choice model held on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. This allowed customers to choose from the food delivered that morning after being sorted and categorized. When the pandemic struck, the pantry was forced over the course of five days to completely revamp its model. Since then, the distribution has been outside in the pantry parking lot on Tuesday mornings, with the vast majority of customers arriving in cars. Boxes are packed by volunteers in an assembly line fashion after several hours spent sorting and organizing food brought that morning from the food depot. In the last two years, as well as food distribution, the pantry has started a small homebound delivery program for those customers who have no way of attending the Tuesday distribution. Gift cards for groceries and gas have been given out one to two times per year. 
As COVID has abated, several programs have been restarted inside the pantry and church. A seed to supper gardening course and ICANN nutrition programs, both through the Santa Fe County Extension Office and NMSU, were offered this spring and summer. And of course, one cannot talk about the pantry without mentioning the Thanksgiving distribution. This has been offered for many years. All food is purchased by the pantry through many generous donations, allowing the distribution to be open to all who may need it. Our customers come to us from all walks of life and many different circumstances. They are families or singles with or without children. They include seniors on fixed incomes, the disabled, and those who find themselves food insecure for various reasons. In the first six months of 2022, 3,774 families were served, which represents 9,130 individuals. Of those, 24% are children, 49% adults, and 27% seniors. Funding for our services come from donations by individuals in Santa Fe, the state, and beyond. The St. John's and other faith communities, private and family foundations, the Las Campanas Community Fund, the St. John's Foundation, and the Santa Fe Community Foundation. In 2021, the pantry had 191 individual donors, 109 of those for the Thanksgiving distribution, and 16 foundation and grant donations, totaling a little over $70,000. Finally, if St. John's Church and the Food Depot form the body of the pantry, its volunteers are its lifeblood. In the beginning, the majority of volunteers were from St. John's. Now the volunteers come from many faith communities and many who are unaffiliated but feel the passion of volunteering. Particularly well represented are the churches along Barcelona Street, which includes Emmanuel Lutheran, Temple Beth Shalom, and the Unitarian Universalist Church. It is ecumenical and interfaith. They come from all walks of life and all over the Santa Fe area. They stand in rain, sun, wind, and freshly plowed parking lot. They sort out rotten vegetables and clean up onion skins that have fallen over the floor like autumn leaves. They make and break boxes. Some of my favorite volunteer stories are from those who live in the area surrounding the church or who were driving by during a distribution. They came to see what was going on and stayed. Our volunteers are the pantry's beating heart and it could not exist without them. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen, for giving us an intro. Everybody sitting at this table here is an active volunteer. There's one exception right next to me who very kindly agreed, who's going to be our first to speak. But they're all, all of these people are actively involved every Tuesday at the food distribution. We have an orderly fashion in which we're going to run this panel. Jonathan, you'll be happy to know that you're going to start things off. Each person will speak in turn, and there are four basic questions that we'll have for each panel member. And each panel member, we didn't rehearse, we didn't practice, will speak about their particular view of each question. You have two minutes to talk, and I have my phone here with me to time you, but I know that you all have an innate sense of time. And I'm not sure I do, but anyway, I will stop you if you've gone on forever and ever, but in the kindest possible way. When we're finished with the four questions, we will do two things. We'll allow for a Q&A. We have a small in-person audience, but they're going to get top priority for asking questions this evening. And we also have a Zoom audience. And Debbie Helper from the League of Women Voters is here to monitor the chat and she'll do that. If it turns out that we have a little bit of time, I have some questions on my mind that I'm going to pose to you to perhaps talk with one another about. And I think it's our lucky night. I think we're going to have some time for a little bit of conversation at the end. And now Irene, it's always wise to discuss your rules that you made yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I've done everything I meant to do. So the first question, pretty easy. We're going to start simply. I'd like each of you to introduce yourself. I'll say your first name. And then if you'll say just something to introduce you, whatever comes to mind, 
say something about who you are, and please do mention your main role in the distribution. So one by one, we're going to start with Jonathan. Introduce yourself, a couple of interesting facts about you, and then what your role is in the distribution. And goodness, Jonathan, you are what we call an essential worker. We'll start with you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you all. My name is Jonathan Griego. Thank you, uh, Mary Allen, Dolph, and Irene for inviting me um, here, and it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. Um, <clears throat> I am a native New Mexican. I was born in Albuquerque. I do not reside in Santa Fe. I actually live in Sandoval County uh, near Bernalillo. Um, two interesting things about me is uh, not only do I enjoy delivering food, but I also enjoy cooking it as well as eating it. And um, I am a diehard Raiders fan, so... <laughs> uh, Las Vegas now. Anyways, um, my main role at the Food Depot is um, I am a full-time employee there, and uh, I am a program distribution coordinator. It's just more of a fancier way of saying a delivery driver. Um, and I do deliver. I'm here every Tuesday morning. I'm here promptly at 8 o'clock, sometimes 10 or 15 minutes late, but I do get the food here, and uh, it gets here on time for these these nice nice folks to distribute. So nice to meet you all and thank you guys for joining us tonight. Thanks, Jonathan. And next up we have Amber. I am Amber Garland and I came to New Mexico in 1975 and got entrapped and <laughs> did go away for a while and, and just had to come back because there's no place like this. Um, I'm a retired school teacher. I taught for 30 years. Before that, I was an Adobe Mason in this area. And now I am a part-time weaver, both artistic and production weaving for a shop downtown. And what I do here at the pantry is um, whatever is needed, <laughs> which that it's a well-oiled machine. One person has to step out or is away for the day and someone just steps in and keeps it going. So uh, mostly I work in the can pantry, we call it, which is where the non-perishables are. And we currently are mostly bagging up cans so that everybody gets a bag full of cans. We try to keep the nutrition pretty balanced and keep the shelves full by ordering food in advance and getting it from the food depot um, and other places and, and make sure that everyone who comes through gets some kind of balanced, nutritious items for their, their pantry to use during the week. Oh, and I... I also am the person that gets to uh, run around and or organize things like Thanksgiving, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of fun because we do have to get donations for everything since it's all going to whoever needs it. And that's really one of the biggest joys. Thank you, Amber. Mary Ellen. Well, again, um, I am Mary Ellen Kendrick and I am one of the co-coordinators of the pantry. Um, I have been living in New Mexico since 1997 with a six-year stint in the Boston area. And like Amber, we couldn't wait to get back. Massachusetts is lovely. However, New Mexico is exceptional. Um, I have been with the pantry since December of 2019, and I actually started by doing the finances. Um, I was asked to help Charles Barbie, who was a longtime volunteer and helped start the pantry and unfortunately passed away recently, but I was asked to help him um, and take over the finances. And so that's what I did until the pandemic. And then somehow in July of 2020, I found myself as a co-coordinator. Not exactly sure how that happened, but it did. Um, but I, I absolutely love it, and I would not trade it for anything. Um, I am a, a member of St. John's United Methodist Church, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I am a recent employee of the church now. I am also the Connections Coordinator. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Mary. Um, good evening. My name is Mary Lucy. And um, my husband, Lenny, and I moved here in 2015 from the Northern Virginia area. And uh, 
we moved here primarily because we had visited here a couple of times. We love the weather and we're both hikers. So the proximity to national parks was especially appealing to us. So we're thrilled to be here. Um, I've been involved in the distribution since 2018 when my sister got me involved in the Thanksgiving uh, distribution. And it was really, it was a great experience. And I just saw how well run it was downstairs with all those turkeys and cranberries and taters and all that kind of pies. And um, anyway, uh, everybody seemed to be enjoying themselves and um, the clients especially were so appreciative. So that, that kind of got me started. Um, I'm a member of St. John's. Um, my role with the food pantry, I have, you know, I kind of am a jack of all trades on Tuesday mornings. I can sort vegetables. I can fill boxes. Um, I could break down boxes, but that's like my least favorite thing to do. <laughs> so I, I hesitate on that. I'll, 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 you know, check the potatoes, but breaking down boxes isn't my favorite thing. And I also have uh, a couple uh, homebound clients that uh, myself and um, a co-volunteer, Lynn Hall, um, we take food to. Um, so that's my story. Thank you, Mary. Matt. I'm uh, Matt Wiebe. Um, I'm a commercial fisher. I just got done with my season and I'm back. Um, I, um, around the pantry, I lift heavy things and uh, break boxes, but uh, mostly sort through food and uh, pack boxes and then uh, lift boxes uh, into cars. Um, I guess I, uh, I don't know, I maybe been doing this uh, three years or something like that, or almost three years. Um, I attend here at uh, St. John's uh, Methodist Church. And um, I guess we're kind of, uh, this is supposed to, I don't know, it just is such a nice um, um, thing to do. Um, you kind of get in the habit of showing up on Tuesday and you just kind of do it. Um, and uh, so it's a it's a very nice uh, operation. Um, I do not like um, uh, bad sweet potatoes, but other than that, uh, everything else is pretty good. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Steve. Hi, uh, Steve McMillan. I've uh, been married forty three years. I have six kids. Uh, they're all grown now, so I now have time for the pantry. <laughs> um, yeah, we moved here about a little over a year and a half ago, and uh, just asked my pastor, you know, what's in town that you know, maybe I could get it plugged into and, you know, volunteer help out, and this was one of the things she suggested, so I came down, applied, got involved, and been doing it ever since. I um, really love this group of people and love doing it, so. Um, uh, although I do like the Raiders, I am definitely a diehard Eagles fan. So. <laughs> okay, thank you, Steve. And now we're on to our second question. And Steve, I like you, and so I'm going to do you a great favor. I think we're going to change it up, and we'll start from Steve's end, okay. and we'll end up with Jonathan, so he doesn't always go first. <laughs> Okay, the next question is, when you think about this personally, just for yourself, but why do you make time to volunteer on a regular basis at this food distribution? Why and how is your time that you spend at the distribution important to you? And why do you keep coming back? <laughs> Steve. Well, first off, I've been involved in volunteering for a lot of things over my lifetime volunteering being involved is very important to me you know i i've been blessed and you know just want to be a blessing to others so this food depot is and food in general has been one of my passions i've been in food pantries for many many years and with a rich country like this, with so much food, it's kind of hard for me to understand. 
there are those out there that are struggling to feed themselves. So being able to be involved in the, this pantry and what they do is extremely important and very fulfilling for me. Um, why I keep coming back is because I think they do a wonderful job here in taking care of the customers. Just a great group of people who really make all their customers feel wanted and loved and cared for. And I don't think I could be in a better situation than that. Thank you, Steve. Matt. Oh, well, I mean, part of it's got to be just that there's hunger and um, there's a lot of food out there. It's just kind of getting the, the two um, uh, situations together. Um, and a lot of it's just the family connection. I and mean, we have so many kids that come through and I, I just know as a parent, sometimes it is a little hard uh, keeping everybody fed and happy. And it's, it's not so nice when all we can give them is Brussels sprouts, but a lot of times we have some fun food that we can pass out to them and they just light up. And it's just such a, it's just such a nice thing to be able to do. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it's I mean, yeah, I keep coming back and uh, I do it because I enjoy it. I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. It's just a nice thing to do. Thank you, Matt. Mary. Well, I'll echo what Steve and Matt said, and that is the fact that there is such a need in our community and in the United States in general um, for people who are hungry and children who are going hungry, that it, it feels like the right thing to do. Um, and I'm even actually more convinced of this when I see the line of cars each week down Barcelona Street. And then when they drive through and their little kids in the back peer over the back seat and they look into the boxes that we've loaded into the cars and they have big eyes and sometimes we even have little toys for them and it's it's heartbreaking, but it's also um, very satisfying um, for me personally to to be able to help in this way. And um, there's a lot of respect uh, at the pantry. Not only uh, the volunteers uh, respect one another, and, and that just goes without saying, but there's a great respect for the clients too and for their dignity. And that is very important to me. And it's demonstrated by our volunteers um, every Tuesday. So I keep coming back because I enjoy the people um, and it, it just gives me a sense of purpose. Um, Thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, personally, for me, I was raised in a Methodist church in Indiana, which was very, very strong in volunteering. So I had that from a very early age, wanting to volunteer to do many different things. About 17 years ago um, this month, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And I have been very fortunate that my disease has been very benign. <coughs> and that has translated into wanting to do all of the good that I can possibly do. Uh, because of that. So when I saw that 23% of children in Santa Fe uh, face food insecurity and 32% of everyone in Santa Fe actually lives in a food desert, I knew that the pantry was going to be what I did here in Santa Fe. I come back because of the wonderful volunteers that we have. It is truly a family. And also because of the clients. And I do want to read to you just a couple of things that I wrote in another piece last fall. They almost always say thank you to us. They frequently say, God bless you. I don't know how many times that has been said to me. And occasionally they say, I don't know what I would have done without you. And that is why I return every week. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Amber. Well, I should mention that I'm the token Buddhist. 
Um, <laughs> and you know what Mary said about respect. Yeah, I've I've felt totally um, embraced and and welcomed. Uh, Mary Ellen just said it's sort of like family and. Uh, people from the pantry came to my house with groceries when I had surgery recently. I mean, this, these are people that are now in my life and weren't before, and we might not have run across one another another way. I first came here because uh, some friends of mine needed food, and I brought them here to see what was available. And the dignity thing, you know, it was it was it was beautiful. It was uh, people offering food to their neighbors. You know, I, I just invited my friends for lunch today. And this was, it, it felt like that. It felt like we care. And of course, you know, you're hungry, you want something to eat. Um, it's just so logical. It's, it's a no brainer. People need to eat. Um, it's not something where politics or philosophies or anything get mixed up for me. It's, it's just, straightforward people need to eat we have access to a way to get some food and so we can make that happen um i want to say that during the pandemic this pantry kept my heart alive i was mostly isolating uh there are a lot of other people that i care very much about i have a lot of support from a lot of communities and we did things on zoom but the food needs to be handed out physically and so I made a decision right at the beginning of the pandemic that I was going to keep coming to this building and do this thing. And what happened from that was I never had isolation. I never had a feeling of being useless and just I'm just sitting here in the world, taking up space and breathing, you know, um, that so many people struggled with so hard. I was like, well, every Tuesday, I'm going to make sure somebody gets some groceries. And it made sense. And I just love these people. This is such a wonderful, wonderful community that um, that I feel honored to, to work with and be part of. Thank you, Amber. Jonathan, your question is a little bit different because your work is a bit different. First, remind us again how long you've worked at the food depot. And then in your time there, what have you learned and observed about the need in our region for food distribution and the extent of people who need food in our area. What have you learned through your work? Okay, so um, uh, it's about two weeks shy of eight months that I have been a full-time employee with the Food Depot. Um, before that, I was actually um, part of another foundation that would actually pick up food similar to what Bag and Hand does. And, um, you know, when I went to the Food Depot, um, the staff there, everybody there was always so nice and helpful. And, um, you know, they they really um, took pride in their work. And that is to, you know, give people food. So I didn't really realize, I, I, everybody knows that, you know, there's a need for food everywhere, you know. And uh, I never really realized how much of an impact the Food Depot makes on the community until I actually started to work there. I remember the first week that I worked there, we had our distribution that we do um, every other week, twice a month. And um, I remember we set up probably about 40 plus pallets, full pallets of um, different kinds of foods from bread and pastries to canned food to frozen food. And um, we do that from seven to 9 a.m. And when we were done at nine, all the pallets were empty. And we probably served probably, I don't know, 500 plus cars, maybe. I don't know if you guys ever see, but our line gets big, just like your guys's. And um, and then also learning that some of our drivers that I work with um, deliver as far as Raton, um, Clayton, Cimarron, Maxwell, you know, all them counties up north. And um, that's really when I realized how much of uh, there is a need for the food. Um, I remember who it was that mentioned the the counties that don't have um it's a it's a food desert um myself i have delivered out there before too and it, it really is you know some of them towns don't have stores some of them little towns don't have um a, a lot of things that that santa fe or bigger cities do have or, or towns have and um you know it's uh it's really nice to 
know that there are other agencies just like Bag and Hand that are out there, way, way out there, you know, almost to Texas and almost as far to Colorado that do exactly what Bag and Hand does and what the Food Depot does. And um, that's really when I learned um, how much of a need there is for food in, in, in Santa Fe, not only Santa Fe, but all over the northern part of New Mexico. <clears throat> Thank you, Jonathan. It's a perspective we need. And the next question, I think we'll start with you again and go back and we'll eventually end up with you, Steve. So, um, Jonathan, what do you like best about the work that you do at the Food Depot? And what is the most difficult part of your job, Jonathan? Okay, so what I enjoy the most about um, my position at the Food Depot is that um, knowing that when I go home at the end of the day, that I made somewhat of an impact every day. You know, I know that there's a, um, there's a saying that I, I've heard all my life is that if you enjoy what you do every day, you, you never work a day in your life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's really, that's truly something that, um, I think a lot of the staff, myself included at the food depot really, really, um, work hard for is that, every day that we go to work, we know that there are kids, um, you know, adults, seniors, um, and and people that need food that, or because of our job, knowing that they got to eat that day or that night or the day after, whatever it may be, whenever it may be. And um, that's one thing that I really, really enjoy about my work. Um, and I think the most difficult part about my job is, you know, one, not only seeing all the people that are really in need of food and are really hungry and stuff like that, but knowing that if my job doesn't get done, then there is that possibility that somebody may not eat that day or that night or the next day or whenever it may be. And, um, but, but mostly um, just knowing that there is those people, there are those people out there that need that food. That's probably the most difficult part. Um, because, you know, we do get a lot of, I'm sure you guys do, and um, a lot of people that do what we do, they, they do get the homeless people that come up or the people that are um, barely making it that come, that are coming and asking for food, you know, and, and, um, and that, that's probably the hardest part about my job is just knowing that and seeing that. But I, I also get to make a difference with my work and, and be able to help that person out every day. Thank you, Jonathan. You're welcome. And then I call this, this question is for all of you who actually work in the distribution of St. John's. I, I work for New Mexico Listens. I named this a purpose-driven community. And so this question is, in what ways do you personally think the people who volunteer have somehow formed into a purpose-driven community. And please give an example or two of how that happened, if you think it happened. Amber. Well, absolutely, it's a, a purpose-driven community. And the first example that comes to mind is the minute something needs to be done, somebody sees that it needs to be done and just does it. Because we're not, it's not about a job description or I'm in the can pantry or, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing about any of us. It's about, and it's not even totally about who is coming to receive food. It's about, there is a need. We have this thing. We have to do this thing. We're very clear on what the goal is. Everybody has the same goal. There's no, um, often there are suggestions of how to make things better. But there's no question about if a box needs to be carried, a box gets carried and whoever is there carries it. Um, so the purpose drives everything that we do. The, the purpose is to get the food to the people who need the food, period. And it's so clear. And it's, uh, it's actually very mentally relaxing because I don't ever have to think I wonder, should I do this or do that? It's very clear what I should do. I should do whatever is the efficient way to get the food to the people who need the food. Thank you, Amber. Well said. Well said, Mary Ellen. 
Well, yes, I would I would actually echo most of what Amber just said. Um, we do all pull together. Sometimes we joke that if only two of us showed up, we would still be able to do this. We would still be able to get people fed. And um, and I think that kind of says it all. Um, all ideas are also welcome, which is something that Amber referred to. Um, there's there's no real boss. I know I'm the co-coordinator, but all ideas are welcome. And if something doesn't work out, that's okay too. Um, and we've come up with a lot of innovations over the last two and a half years. And sometimes we sort of smack ourselves on the head and go, Duh, we should have done that a year ago. Um, <laughs> but um, I think it's just the way we all pull together. We come on Tuesday morning with the purpose of getting these people fed. And we are going to do that no matter what it takes. And if we get the food and have 45 minutes to do it, we will. And I would like to give at this point a shout out to Jonathan, if I could. We had a particularly difficult Tuesday last week. Jonathan arrived to inform me that he had nothing in his truck but a few cakes and pies. And we, we pulled together and we pulled our ideas together and made a plan and changed the plan and redid the plan. Um, however, Jonathan called around and he found the driver out at the Super Walmart and that driver named David came. And I don't know if he had ever delivered to a pantry before, <laughs> um, but he was wonderful. <laughs> and so I, you are definitely part of our purpose driven community, Jonathan, thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. And <laughs> good shout out to Jonathan. Yes. Mary. Well, I can't really top those three things, <laughs> but um, I agree with everything they said. Um, but I feel like the fact that there are so many regular volunteers, the same people come every Tuesday, uh, is evidence that they believe in this purpose, which is to distribute food. Um, I mean, it's fulfilling. We all know that. And well, those of us up here and the rest of the volunteers. Um, and for me, this is my community. So... I'm sure the other volunteers feel the same way or they wouldn't come every every week with a smile on their faces. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Matt. Well, I, I sound like I'm the only one that had the Google purpose driven community. I had no idea what that meant. Um, I'm not sure I still do, but uh, um, I, I would have to agree with Amber. It is it's kind of like a dance in there when we're doing the food. I mean, everybody's moving around and uh, nobody's bumping into each other and uh, everything seems to get done. And we get a lot of things that are uh, uh, wrenches thrown into the works and uh, they're kind of uh, papered over fairly quickly. And uh, no, it, it, it's uh, it, it, it really is uh, surprising uh, how smoothly it goes, given how bumpy um, uh, some of the stuff is with sometimes we get bad food or sometimes we get late food or sometimes the parking lot didn't get plowed or sometimes it's windy and we can't set up canopies and but everything just works so smoothly. It's it's uh, really a surprise. Um, I don't know if I covered purpose driven community, but. I think it was perfect. Okay. Well done. <laughs> Steve. Wow. Being last here is not the best thing, but uh, <laughs> with everything that's being said, I, it's true. Um, if it's just a, a large group of people there or just a few of us, it doesn't matter. It gets done. Everybody there is passionate about getting it done and doing the best job they can to make sure that everybody gets fed. And they do it with smiles on their faces, and you hear a lot of joking. And like Matt said, it's, it's a dance, but it goes so smoothly, even with all the bumps and and the end product is everybody gets fed. So it's it's just a wonderful environment to be in, and I hope we continue doing this. Thank you, Steve. And you don't have to be last because now you can be first. <laughs> um, the last question that I gave, I gave you is what is your hope for the future of 
the St. John's Pantry food distribution. But if anybody has anything to elaborate on, Matt, I love your metaphor about the dance. So if you have any more to say about that dance and how and why it works. I, I don't dance, so. <laughs> well, what do you do? No, 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 I, I, I observe. Uh, Actually, I can't, I can't resist saying this, Matt. You do the box step. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. anyway, we're looking ahead at the food distribution for what you hope for, not globally what you hope about world hunger and that kind of thing, but just what you hope for in the pantry. And then any further thoughts you'd like to add on that dance that we all do so smoothly together, despite the bumps and the surprises. Steve, you're first. Well, I just, again, I continue, hope we continue to reach the community the best we can and feed as many people as possible. I know uh, this summer we tried to uh, expand a little bit and I hope over the future that those opportunities are provided again and then we get to reach even more people than we can. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. Hell, I um, I'd have to say I wish uh, occasionally that we'd get higher quality food to pass out. Um, sometimes it's it's spoiled, or sometimes the bread's a little crunched, and um, sometimes the uh, vegetables uh, maybe saw a better day a week ago. Um, and some I just wish it, it was a, a little bit better quality stuff we could pass out and set of uh, what's obviously uh, coming to the end of its uh, shelf life. Um, and then maybe just uh, people to take better advantage of it. Um, I mean, we handle our crowd fairly quickly and um, it is a lot of work, but uh, there is a lot of dead space and you somehow wish, you know, folks, if you knew how this whole operation worked, you could just be in and out of here in, in no time. Um, but I don't know, you know, that's more of a marketing or I, I don't know what that is, but I, I just think that we could, uh, push more people through. I mean, we, we, we've got it down and, uh, I just wish people could take advantage of the systems that we have. Thank you, Matt. Interesting thought. Mary. Well, I know you said I couldn't say this, but my hope for the future of the pantry food distribution is simple that there would no longer be a need or as great a need, how about that, um, in our area and in, in New Mexico. Um, but since that hasn't happened yet, um, I hope that we can continue to grow our volunteer roles and have more people volunteer, which means maybe we could expand that Saturday uh, distribution. Um, I also hope that we continue to receive uh, grants and donations um, so that we can buy quality food. Um, and what else did I write? Oh, and that uh, perhaps we could expand uh, with more volunteers uh, delivery to our homebound clients and kind of get that squared away maybe with Food Depot sharing or you know kind of sharing the load that kind of thing um so if we can't eliminate it let's try to expand it and get um more volunteers and more grants and donations thank you mary mary ellen well i really i really have two goals for the pantry in the future and some of that is predicated on COVID or, or any other pandemics that might come up in the future, um, abating to the point where we can come back inside the pantry. Um, I would like to expand the pantry to more than one day and to be able to go to the grocery store model. That is really the gold standard in food distribution so that people have the dignity of choosing their food for themselves. So that is one thing. I also had the privilege of helping one of our customers two years ago at this point get better housing. And I took her from agency to agency in different places. And part of this was because of COVID. 
but there was very little help in actually, uh, well, actually having help with the paperwork and all of that. And I discovered that what that means to someone like this customer is that she needed to fill out all of this paperwork, volumes of it really sometimes, on her smartphone. Very difficult to do. Uh, sometimes you get through it and try to submit it and it doesn't like that, it doesn't work. And you also cannot print it out for yourself. And so I got to thinking about that. And I got to thinking that what we really needed in the pantry was some kind of business center with a computer and a printer and maybe a social worker or somebody who can help with the computer or who understands these agencies and can help. Because what we really want to do is raise people up so that they don't need our services, like Mary Lucy said. The goal is to be out of business. And then we can all just socialize with each other and go out to eat or whatever. But that is the ultimate goal. Um, I note that TFAP, which stands for the Emergency Food Assistance Program, was created over 40 years ago. That hardly seems like the word emergency fits at this point. It seems like that's more of a fact. So what we need to do is think outside the box and come up with ways that we can help these people other than just handing them a box of food because really they need so much more than that. Mm -hmm. and, and those would be my hopes for the pantry in the future. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Amber. Well, I'm all about what Mary Ellen was just talking about. I envision us being open, for example, all day long on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, right? So we hit people that have different yeah. work schedules. There are so many people that don't have enough food, but they're, meanwhile, they're working full time and they have very little money. And um, sometimes it's, are we going to have meat this week or are we going to get shampoo or are we going to get the kid new shoes? You know, the choices have to be made. And um, it would be so nice to just say, OK, the food pantry is open on these days, these hours. People come in, they shop. We don't send a big bag of split peas home with every single person because some people don't have the time or the equipment or the patience or the know-how to deal with a bag of split peas, right? Um, and they'd much rather have four cans of soup. And so it would be wonderful if people could come in and shop and go around with their carts and then get to the register or actually the register would probably be first and they would show their number and then go around and shop and, and take their groceries home. Um, and I'm all about the, the computer room and the social worker. And one of the things that we have tried to gather is um, phone numbers of different organizations and, and places people can go for certain kinds of help. But there isn't a lot of time always. If somebody comes to us in an emergency, great. We can we can say, oh, here's a phone number for this or that. But most people, there there isn't, you know, we say, hi, how are you doing? And have a good week. And we may never know what they actually need. Um, there, there were people recently that asked me to try and contact someone here to say thank you because the man was going into hospice and they weren't going to be through anymore. And they wanted to say thank you to a certain volunteer. Um, there, there's so much more that perhaps we could do if we had time to get to know the folks. And when they used to come in and sit for a long time waiting um, for everything to be set up, uh, you know, we got to chatting and we got to know certain people. Uh, and some people uh, are, you know, I still see them occasionally. And, and we know one another and we work together on things. And so uh, it does form more of a community. And so I am also hopeful that we can have the face-to-face. The -face. And if it were open more times, we don't need to do this mass production thing. It could be the same number of volunteers being here at different times, a few at a time. What I'd miss about that is the gang. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, there's something about we all descend on this place. 35 people descend on this place at the same time every week and and uh, and make this thing happen. But but I think it would be really wonderful for people who need food if we could go to that other model and and have have this be a place that is open for service, uh, more hours and for more services. Thank you, Amber. Jonathan, I think I would like to hear your thoughts on the question that I posed to the other volunteers. What do you hope for in your work? Well, um, first of all, um, you know, to what Matt said, um, I will do my very best to try to bring you guys, you know, best quality of food that we can provide. Um, so that's one goal that's going to be set for future for you guys and for us and for me as well uh, a challenge that I'll have to go through every Tuesday morning but I will do my very best to try to get you guys better quality food um and and yeah absolutely what um you know what Mary Allen said because I I do know that um and if you guys don't know um the food depot has been expanding um over the past year maybe or so a couple of what I'm what I'm aware of, but we don't only provide services for food. Um, you know, we do have a diaper distribution that we help out with um, every week, and we also do have um, resource navigators that um, are also full time employees for us that um, try to help um, people that that need it in different different areas, whether it be housing, whether it be um, you know acquiring. Uh, different kinds of assistance through the state or or you know if they are elderly or you know whatever they may need that is what the resource navigators are there for and um you know i think that's a very good idea what you said mary allen also about the um um you know the opportunity for these people to come in and actually choose what they like because you know we do experience that um where when we do our distributions too, because we occasionally get our vegetarians or our vegans who ask that they don't get meat, but if they can get extra vegetables or an extra, um, you know, eggs or whatever it may be that we're handing out. Um, so that is a, a very good idea. And, um, you know, what also uh, um, what you said is that to um, expand it to more days you know, because that's very true that a lot of people may not, are, are not available to come um, on Tuesday mornings or just like us, we do it before, we do it at seven to nine, you know, and that's fairly early. When I come into work, um, and I usually get there sometimes around 4.30 to start our distribution, start getting stuff ready. Mm -hmm. There are cars that are lined up, you know, and it's fortunate for them because some of them may um, not work or maybe be retired or they, they're, they're not at work that early so they can come. But for people that may be at work at that time, it's better to make more, more hours available for them to come and get the food that we are offering, you know? So that's a very good idea. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. That's the end of our four questions, but that's the end of our four questions, but I hope that there'll be some questions from you in the audience. And then Debbie is in the back. We'll see if we have any questions in the chat. So first of all, for those of you who are here now, anything that you would like to ask, this is a fairly rich source of information you have sitting before you. I've learned so much, so much from listening to you. Anything you would like to comment or ask about? Pastor Matt. Um, Can you hear him okay? Mm -hmm. In the past, other circumstances, I've noticed uh, in the microphone for the room. Oh, well, wait a minute. Uh, I've noticed in other food pantries, and along with this one as well. Uh, the use of the word client and the use of the word customer. Can you expand a little bit more on the decision behind, you know, client, customer, and, and just some of the, the language? I can, yes. Mm -hmm. um, client is probably the word you will hear most. It is the word that has been used mostly in the past. But customer is 
the more modern word to use. It is the word that food pantries are trying to use and I lapse back and forth into it, I have to admit, but I'm trying to use customer. And the reason uh, is because it fosters the idea of customer service, that that's what we are giving to them. Um, when I first started using it, it was brought up that that's not the definition of customer. The definition of customer is more like somebody who pays for something. But like I said, it fosters the idea of customer service. I, I also worked at the IRS and you use the word customer there as well. That is the modern word there and that it is for the same reason. Yes, Roberta. Um, I, I wonder um, if there's any solution to the problem of families being different sizes. So when the customer comes, whether they have no children or five children, I would think should make a difference in how much food we provide. And I just wonder what you think about that and whether there's a way to address it. Thanks, Roberta. Would anybody like to speak to that? No. Okay. Uh, well, we did make the adjustment um, that when we had a family of five or more, we would start giving out an extra box. It was a little before my time, but when I asked about this, when I first started at the pantry, I was told that it was just too difficult to do. Um, I'm not really sure that it's too difficult. I, I think it's just a problem that really needs to be looked at. Um, the little that I did work inside the pantry, chips would be given out if you were able to get a, a an extra box or extra food. Um, I'm afraid I didn't work at the pantry long enough to understand what that decision was. I wasn't at that time, and I'm going to ask Dolph if he can address that. Can you do so, Dolph? <laughs> Would you be able to address that? I'm handing you the mic, Dolph. Speechless. <laughs> um, I really can't remember, to be honest with you. I think it was um, that uh, everybody got the same thing, basically. And although we know how many people are in a person's, in a family, um, each person was able to just take what we had available um, at that time. But what we did during the pandemic was we looked at um, at, at trying to serve uh, more food to larger families. And we did some analysis on that. And um, our steering committee came up with uh, serving uh, an extra box to families of five or more. And we're now serving anywhere from 15 to 20. 25, 20 boxes yeah. uh, each time each distribution um so i i to be honest with you roberta it, it'd be the the best thing we could do would be to be able to serve a, a, you know proportionately to the size of the family um it, it'd be a very good thing and i can hear mary ellen saying she'd like to look into that <laughs> <laughs> i would and i thank you thank yeah. you for jumping in there i appreciate it um I mean, we are obligated to try and make everything as equal as possible. So that's part of the problem as well. Um, I think that could be something that would be uh, easier to address when we go to like a grocery store model. I, I think that would definitely make it easier. Yeah. Great question, Roberta. Yeah. Great question. Yes, Maria. I'm wondering, I, I volunteered for a while until I got a, another job and I couldn't come any longer. Um, so I kind of left sort of in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I'm curious, um, has there been a fluctuation in, in, the, in the amount of people that have come? Um, has it been different? Has it been the same folks? Um, and now that the price of food has gone up again, has that changed the distribution? That type of thing. So at the height of the pandemic and the shutdown, 
in the spring of 2020, and I believe you you were with us then, we were serving 275 households. That has dropped down to um, between 135 and about 155. I, and I think everyone else probably as well, can definitely watch the news and uh, watch what's going on with the economy and you can see the fluctuations in it. But we have recently rather stabilized at that 135, 155. Now, the interesting thing about that is that we went from having maybe six or seven extra boxes to suddenly starting, I think this May or June, of almost consistently having 20 extra boxes. So larger families started coming more. So that's a trend. Um, we'll see now that school has started, if that's the case. I know we were told um, uh, by someone who actually was over at the Children's Museum and saw the distribution and came over and her comment to one of the registrars, registrars was that she didn't know how she was gonna feed her kids over the summer, that that was more of a problem. So we'll see um, now that school has started, if that's still the case or not, I guess we'll probably know that better um, Tuesday <laughs> on what that's doing. Uh, but you can definitely see the fluctuations okay. with the economy. Thank you. Debbie, do we have any Zoom questions? Okay. I have a comment um, about the the quality food, and you know we we get delivered what is donated. You know that's what that's what happens. What is available is brought to us. But uh, recently, the farmers market people have started donating any unsold produce at the end of the the farmers market every Saturday, and um, a couple of volunteers are are bringing that over. And those people are wanting to participate and are excited about the idea that if they have unsold produce, that there's a place that they can, can get it to who will actually get it to people who need to eat. And I see that kind of thing and that kind of thinking expanding. So I have a comment with that to add, something to add. Um, Getting higher quality produce is something that Amber and I in particular talked about for a while and continue to talk about, and uh, the farmer's market has been very responsive, and I do want to thank Amber and her friend Adele for taking this on, and uh, we seem to be getting more and more produce every week, and I don't know if there are more farmers or it's harvest time or, or what that is, but it's beautiful produce, and we also, uh, last year, was it last year, Doc? Not the year before. Last year, we got the uh, refrigerator. We got a, a large three-door refrigerator uh, with money from St. John's Foundation. And that was the purpose of getting that refrigerator was to go to the farmer's market or go to any of the other places in town that, that might do these kinds of things and trying to get fresher produce to our customers. Roberta. Another question. I know, um, Mary Ellen, I think you're a master gardener, right? I am. And you talked about getting master gardeners to donate some of their excess pro produce that they raised at home. I was wondering whether that's I happened. keep trying. Okay. <laughs> um, whenever whenever I uh, work in the vegetable garden, I, I try to get that word out. Uh, that's been a little slower in coming about. Um, they don't allow me to put anything in their newsletter about it, unfortunately. So I just have to go around and, and give out a little business card and talk it up. But I did find the last time I went that that they recognized me and they they knew you know that I was asking about that. So so we'll see. Um, now is the time that a lot of excess produce comes in, and you look at your garden and think, I have more zucchini than I could eat in five years. And hopefully then they'll be calling me to come and, and pick some of that up. And people do uh, come in sometimes with a couple big boxes of apples. That's true. Or whatever. People sometimes we just find produce, don't we? Uh -huh. Yeah. Produce comes. <laughs> yeah. Produce sometimes just shows up. <laughs> okay. I think we can do maybe one more question. Is there anybody who has something on their mind? 
they would like to ask. Okay, well, I, I'll thank you again for coming out and seeing this. And I am going to turn things back to Mary Ellen for a little bit of a closure. And then I have a, one or two things to say. Okay. Well, I do want to thank, I want to thank the panel. Um, thank you so much for participating in this. And I want to thank all of you here and out in Zoom land uh, for attending. I want to encourage everyone to volunteer. There are many food pantries in the area that could use your help. You don't have to choose the bag in hand. It also includes the food depot. And I don't, Jonathan, do you know how many volunteers you have at the food depot? I, I couldn't even tell idea? you. Any idea? I don't, I don't either, but I know it's a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can volunteer there as well. I guarantee that you will get more out of it than the customers do. Thank you. And I'll echo Mary Ellen. Thank you very much for agreeing to spend your Sunday evening here and being part of the panel. I think that your voices are very important. I think they're more important than I even realized that the ideas you've shared are ideas that people need to hear. Part of the joy of working for New Mexico Listens is thanks to Bethany, your words will stay and be heard by people. This session will be recorded and will be on the New Mexico Humanities Council site. And I believe we're also having them on the League of Women Voters, Santa Fe County site, so they'll be shared. And this is indeed news to people. People can say, yes, there's hunger and oh my, there are food lines. They don't know. And so we needed every voice on this panel. Thank you for terrific questions. And with that, I think we'll draw to a conclusion. Maybe I'll give one shout out to our videographer, who is the reason <laughs> that we're able to archive things and do that. But thank all of you for coming out. And again, thanks to the panel. Thanks. Nice. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Irene. Thanks, kids. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you.